Welcome everybody, and uh, let's start uh, this uh, session. And uh, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Professor Ji Dongjia. Uh, Professor Ji Dongjia is a director of Liver Research Center, Beijing Friendship Hospital. And uh, he was uh, president of International Association of the Study of the Liver, and the previous president of uh, Apostle and uh, Chinese Society of Hepatology. Today, he will talk about the Apostle guideline on the management of PBC. Professor Jia, please. Thank you for your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a good honor for me to be here on the invitation by Professor uh, Tanaka. Uh, today I just uh, speak to you about the draft version for the EPESO guidance on the diagnosis and the management of PBC. It is well known that PBC is an autoimmune liver disease, but clinically and biochemically, it is also called static liver disease, which is mainly affect the interlobular small bile ducts interlobular, uh, we can see that's the schematic showing uh, the, the uh, location of the major damage of the interlobular bile duct. Then this slide also summarizes the clinical uh, features of this disease. We talk a lot. I don't think I need to repeat this. This is histopathologically interlobular, uh, non-purulent, non-suppressive uh, Cholangitis uh, infiltrate with lymphocytes sometimes will form the, the, the follicle and also sometimes uh, will need to be differentiated from other disease. Biochemically, the elevation of ALP and the gamma GT is significant with mild to moderate elevation of uh, transaminase. Most importantly, this disease have a uh, biomarker, I would say, like uh, AMA, M2 positivity, and then in recent years also, they have the positivity of anti-GP2210 uh, and SP100. So, and clinically, we treat this disease with UDCA and other regions. So this is a summary. So this disease traditionally uh, originally reported from Western countries, but it lasted decades PBC was increasingly reported from Asian countries in this area. Therefore, to increase awareness and improve the uh, uh, standard care and also to improve the clinical outcomes of the patient with PBC, a group of clinical experts and also invited some methodological experts to try to formulate, to draft uh, guidelines. The recommendation was try to formulate it with the grade system. That means the evidence graded by one to three, four, and also the recommendation graded by two. That's the, we can see that's the strength of the evidence, that's the, the strength of the, that's the level of evidence, that's the strength of recommendation. Uh, in this draft guideline guidance, we include all major issues. Uh, so today for the limitation of time, I'll just briefly talk about epidemiology, uh, the diagnosis and treatment, and a little bit about natural history and the prognosis of this disease. So for the full uh, text, I will send to the um, uh, major group, major members of the groups for discussion. Now so this is uh, uh, the uh, schematic showing what are we, we have done? That means for the uh, epidemiology, we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis by our co-workers, our colleagues in the methodology uh, sections. You can see by uh, searching the literature, finally we included 16 papers for the final analysis. Uh, this is a prevalence in our region, Asia Pacific area. This is per million people. We can see the overall uh, uh, prevalence was 76 uh, per uh, million. So this is 
including Australia and New Zealand, and also, of course, you can see the major data from these areas. This is some of them are so-called population-based. Uh, some of them actually are from the uh, hospital-based. For the incidence, we can see this is overall we have nearly 30 per million in this area. For the now next is for the diagnosis of PBC. Uh, of course, we know the AMA positive in over 90% of patients with PBC, but still a small percentage, around 10% or 5 10% of patients who are negative for PBC, but may positive for other markers. So here we just also conduct another systematic review and meta-analysis, try to figure out the, the diagnostic value of some uh, ANAs. So finally, out of 3, 000, over 3,000 papers, finally we included nine papers into the meta-analysis. So this is uh, the overall, uh, the, the sensitivity and specificity of AMAs in diagnosis of AMA negative PBC. Previously, there are already some meta-analysis addressing the diagnostic value, uh, sensitivity and specificity of AMAs in diagnosis of PBC. But here we just stress the for the diagnosis of AMA negative PBC, you can see the overall overall sensitivity uh, on pricing it is low, uh, just uh, you can see uh, twenty seven percent, whereas the specificity is high, it's ninety eight percent. Now we split into two major subtypes of uh, ANA here, like uh, the uh, anti GP uh, two. 110, you can see similarly the sensitivity is less than 20%, 18%. Now, but specificity is nearly 100%, 99%. For SP100, it is similar. It's slightly higher uh, sensitivity, I mean 25%, whereas the specificity is slightly lower, is 96%. This, this is a diagnostic value, uh, the, the area under the curve. You can see overall around, this is for SGP210, so the overall area under the curve 0 0.73, whereas for SP100, the area under the curve is slightly higher, is around 0 0.8. So from this meta-analysis, we can conclude that these two sub type of uh, ANA are very spe highly specific for those who are negative for AMA. Because this is, uh, this picture shown, I think, uh, by Dr. Ma, this is just show the, the, the uh, pathological features of this disease I already mentioned earlier. It is very important for those who are negative for AMA M2, uh, maybe also those for negative for SP, uh, 210 and SP100, GP210 and SP100. So here, this is a diagnostic flu chart uh, for PBC. In patients with elevation of serum uh, cholestatic liver enzyme, we call ALP or and or gamma GT. You can see, first of all, we need to rule out the, the uh, extrahepatic uh, obstruction by imaging technique like ultrasonography, CAT scan, or uh, MRI. If there's this some sign of that, we explore other etiology like PSC, gallstone, or tumors in the biliary system. If there are no dilatation of the biliary system, we test the AMA. If it is positive, then we're quite confident to have diagnosis of PBC. If it's negative, we need to do, usually we need to do liver uh, biopsy. If, if there are typical findings, then we can make diagnosis of PBC. So this is a major flu chart for the diagnosis. Then for, this is a recommendation. Either fulfill the, if the patient with biochemical evidence of uh, cholestasis, like elevation of ALP and gamma GT, and occlusion of actual hepatic biliary obstruction by imaging modalities, then in the presence of AMA positivity or 
have histological evidence, then we can make the diagnosis of PBC. For MA negative patient, if liver biopsy is not available, then the two serial markers, I mean the subtype of ANA, also very helpful. They are very uh, specific for the diagnosis of PBC. So we can also use this for the diagnosis of AMA negative PBC. For those both negative for AMA and negative for these two markers, of course, we need have to do, rely on the uh, liver biopsy. So that's the recommendations. Another one, for AMA positive alone, that means normal liver enzyme, normal ALT, normal AST, normal uh, alkaline phosphatase, normal gamma GT, and no uh, evidence of histological changes, that means AMA positive alone is not sufficient to diagnose PBC. For this kind of patient, we need to follow up with biochemical uh, assessment at least annually. Uh, if necessary, we need to do liver biopsy. So that's the thing. That because of recent uh, publication that the follow-up of a large group of patients who are the, for this group, they have only positive for AM, uh, AMA, but no stability diagnosis. Uh, then the follow-up uh, uh, for five years, you can see. Then finally, you can see at one, three, and five years, only two, seven, and 16% of patients could make diagnosis for PBC. So for this kind of patient, we recommend, therefore we recommend long-term long repeat, repeat regular follow-up liver function test and timely liver biopsy may be helpful for this kind of patients. But at the moment, we do not recommend treatment for this kind of patients who solely are positive for AMA. Then for uh, overlap syndrome, well, we use, more or less, we still use a classical definition, uh, although we also have some evidence reported from China by Professor Ma's group. Instead of 1.5, maybe 1.3 uh, can increase the sensitivity of diagnosis, a uh, specific uh, sensitivity of diagnosis of uh, overlap syndrome, PBC, I mean, PBC IH overlap syndrome. So still elevation of ALT, elevation of IgG level and moderate, at least the moderate interface hepatitis. So at least uh, two of these should be fulfilled. For the treatment of PBC, we didn't conduct a new uh, systematic review and meta-analysis because there, 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 is, there was one just published a, a couple of years ago. So we just use this evidence in that meta-analysis, they include a lot of patients, 74 trials, nearly 6,000 patients. They compare uh, almost all the available modalities. So finally, they, uh, uh, they give us uh, evidence for the recommendation. For the first line of therapy, of course, we recommend oral UDCA at a dose of 13 to 15 milligram per kilogram body weight uh, as a standard of care of, for treatment for all PBC patients. This treatment should be lasted for lifelong. This, this is long-term therapy. This is very important because in Asia, at least, uh, uh, at least in China, a lot of patients repeatedly ask us, when can I stop UDCA? So a lot of doctors also ask this question. So we add this emphasize the importance. Then we, for those who are, have suboptimal response, though according to different uh, criteria, this is a, a, a concise uh, review uh, published last couple of years ago by our group, just summarize the current standards uh, criteria for those uh, suboptimal uh, response. Then this is newly published two formulas uh, for the from global score or UK score, uh, how to then is very useful to to uh, uh, clarify whether it is responsive, well or suboptimal. For those with suboptimal response, now we recommend budesonide might be added to non-serotic PBC patients 
with suboptimal response to UDCA after half a year or one year therapy. We can also recommend benzofibrate or phenofibrate in combination with UDCA for patients with inadequate response to UDCA. Of course, the side effects should be closely monitored in cirrhotic patients with PBC. We also could recommend uh, ob uh, obatic cholic acid, although it's not proved in China, we hope in the, maybe in some other countries or in this area could be proved very soon, could be added to UDCA for PBC patients with compensated liver cirrhosis, then add inadequate response. But this is, should be uh, very careful. This cannot be used in a patient with D liver decompensation. So this is what we uh, consider. Then that's recommendation for the PBC AH overlap syndrome. Corticosteroids can be used with or without immune suppressive that like azocyprine, mycophenolate, morphentile can be added to UDC standard therapy in this kind of patients. Of course, we can also, at the very beginning, we have a combination therapy, UDC plus immune suppressive therapy, if the diagnosis is confident. Otherwise, we can give the UDC for three months, six months, then we add this immune suppressive therapy. Now, this is a recommendation, next recommendation on the management of complications like pruritus, uh, osteoporosis, so this is there's nothing special. We more or less we 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 have the same recommendation as the ASLD and the ESO uh, guideline, like the first line therapy for pruritus, uh, cholestyramine for pruritus. Then maybe we have rifampicin. Uh, this is anti-TB drugs uh, for this for pruritus uh, for to prevent. Osteoporosis, we can give oral calcium and vitamin D. For those already have osteoporosis, biophosphatide can be considered in these kind of patients who with the, the uh, severe bone uh, disease. For those who failed all this, then liver transplantation is the last option for these patients. Then for decommon liver cirrhosis, with a mild score, more than 15 uh, male risk of score higher than 7.8, or severe intractable pruritus, liver transplantation can be considered. UDCA treatment post-liver transplantation is safe and effective to improve liver function test. There are also some one study showing it could reduce the relapse rate after the liver transplantation. Uh, the last part is uh, the, for the prognosis. This is list all the, these first three are models to uh, predict the, the survival, long-term survival of patients with PBC without treatment. All the others actually have uh, response criteria. They have also have long-term prognosis in patients who are treated with uh, UDCA. Then this is our own study from single center experience over 700 cases. Of course, not surprisingly, this, this survival is much better in those no, non-cirrhotic. This is with common liver cirrhosis. This is with decommon liver cirrhosis. This is a long-term uh, follow-up study. Then uh, maybe one or two major findings. We also we found that in, our, in this cohort of patients, uh, more female patients, instead of 90%, maybe it's less than that. Also, in our, this group, we found male sex was an independent risk factor for poor survival. But we cannot exclude the, the, the other confounding factors. Uh, there may be some other factors, but in the, at least in this. Then, past HBV infection, that means negative for surface antigen, but positive for anti core is not associated with a poor uh, prognosis in patients with PBC. So that's the draft for discussion. We already 
uh, got response from uh, many professors. Some of them are already in the audience. We also, next step, we'll try to revise it, and we invite external reviewers uh, to give us comments, try to improve the final uh, text. Lastly, I will thank all the, 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 the uh, team on the drafting this gu guidance from mainland China, from Japan, India, Turkey, Korea, Singapore, and many other countries. Uh, this is work, mainly work together with Professor Ma Xiong group and myself, uh, my own group. So uh, including not only clinical experts, but also some methodological uh, team. So we hope we can uh, finish this work very soon. And finally, uh, I like to thank all the professors in the early years, they give us uh, some uh, motivation to teach us what is this disease, like uh, uh, his coat, Professor Mans of more on PBC, uh, on AIH, of course, uh, his coat, and uh, also Professor Gershwin. He visited China many, many uh, uh, times. I think the Jack, the Jack is the same. He likes this <laughs> color, I mean, like this style. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's not here. Uh, but uh, we, we thank him, or thank all the professors who uh, give us the, the kind of uh, uh, support and advice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for all your efforts to prepare this uh, excellent uh, manuscript, and uh, this is open for discussion. So congratulations for the kind of body of work for the <clears throat> preparing the manuscript, for the, not guideline, but guidance. So my question is, how many clinical questions did you make for this manuscript? Uh, well, we, we try to use the PICO format. Yeah. But yeah. how many? We, uh, well, here I cannot tell you because I cannot remember that. We least try to the, uh, the epidemiology. This is the one the major uh, question. Of course, there are several incidents, prevalence, and also the, uh, the survival, the prognosis. So that's one area, one section. Another diagnosis. What is the major diagnostic rule? As you, you see, we conducted a systematic review on the uh, diagnostic uh, value of uh, NA subtypes in those who are negative for AMA. That's one, that's major and things. Then also for the treatment, we just use another systemic review, not conducted by ourselves, but are reported. They compare the major therapies like UDCA, different combination, all these kind of things. So that's all we have. The second question is, mm. uh, even it is the guidance, not guideline, but you had the, you make the recommendation. So yeah. my question is, did you include, include the kind of uh, stakeholder, the patients, advocates, uh, in terms of the making the uh, manuscript? Yes, that's a very good question. We didn't uh, include the patient because in, in Asia, maybe, right. especially in China, patient group is a little bit a sensitive issue. Maybe uh, the, uh, uh, they are not, uh, there are no official patient group. And also, uh, usually, uh, I, I, to my understanding, to my knowledge, there are no any, any guideline or, or consensus have, the, maybe we have to consider the patient needs, but no patient group in, uh, participate in this process. And the final one is, Okay, so guideline that totally depends on the socio-economical situation of the each nation. So yeah. that's why. Yeah. How do you think about the implementation of Im implementation of this guideline to each nation? So your focus is for the mid or high income Asian countries or all kind of Asian countries. How do you think about it? Uh, yes, that, that, that's that. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I fully understand your question. And especially the guideline issued by WHO, they, they, they consider the minimum requirements, they always recommend things, recommend things that could be done in, in major countries. In Asian Pacific area, they are not as diverse as the WHO guideline, but also I agree with you, there's, a, there's some heterogeneity. Uh, but for this disease, you see, 
we do not have recommended so many sophisticated, we do not need sophisticated procedures or examinations, but just a kind of routine biochemical, immunology, uh, and uh, radiology, and uh, pathology. So maybe it is, it would be an issue, but uh, I don't think that's a big issue, but uh, increased awareness would be more important. Thank but you. I realize them already. So sophist sophisticated. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you for your comments. We, we need to consider that, that maybe in the recommendation, we, we consider the, the strength of recommendation. We need to usually one or two, two usually not strong recommendation. You can see from this short treatment, we don't recommend UDC is uh, recommended as one, or the others as two. So it's optional. It's maybe adopted by the social economic uh, situations. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much and well done for, for the work. Um, just to, to highlight that we as a patient organization were involved with reviewing the ESO guidelines. Um, we do have members in the Asia Pacific region and our website is available in, in both Chinese and Japanese. So if we can help, then I'm, I'm more than happy to extend that offer. Um, with regard to my question, my question to you, sir, is now, does it present an opportunity to future-proof the document and instead of talking about AIH overlap, to talk about PBC with features of AIH? Just a, a question. Uh, well, this is, uh, this is uh, the very, uh, thank, first of all, thank you for your, for your offer. Then for the second question, uh, that's an uh, academic uh, issue at the discussion, of course. Uh, somehow, I agree with you. Well, this uh, kind of definition always have pros and cons. If you say that PVC with autoimmune feature, that would be easier to understand, maybe to avoid uh, some controversy. But uh, at the, f the, the, the drafting of this, this guideline, this guidance, I would say, guidance less stringent, less formal, that's why we try to use this, because the evidence is not that strong, although they're accumulating evidence from this area. Um, but I, I, maybe uh, if Professor Ma would like to recommend this, because this part is uh, Professor Ma is expert in, the, in, the, in the, his specific study to address the issue of PBCAH uh, overlap syndrome. So the question is whether we consider to adopt the term Instead of overlap syndrome, we use the PBC with autoimmune features. I think that's a, just a matter of, of terms. Professor Ma, would you like to give some comment on this? <laughs> so, uh, International Autoimmune Appetite Group uh, recommend uh, the uh, variant uh, yeah. uh, with uh, autoimmune appetite features. I think it uh, don't matter. I, I think the, it's a, just a term and uh, yeah. the diagnosis and the treatment is the same. Uh, yeah. So basically, you mean the criteria and the treatment is the same, just a, a matter of the name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the future, we need to con seriously consider this kind of, if we commit more evidence. Thank you. Okay, so let me ask you, uh, so, so what is the next step? So when, when will it be completed and published? I understand that Professor Saring urged, urged us uh, very much as soon as possible complete this. <laughs> so you have already circulated this, uh, including me. So, so what, what is the next step? So uh, what, what I, I think now we already got the feedback from s not all, but, uh, but most of the uh, professors uh, we sent to uh, for internal uh, review or comments. We will finish that, but still need some 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 wording, some retraining. Maybe after quick, very quickly, we after the finalize the drafting, then we send to a few of professors we call external reviewer, like these professors outside this area. We call external reviewers. By doing so, I we hope within several weeks we could finish all this but not as quick as Professor Sarin's requirement. He required us, or now this time already should be finished. <laughs> but I think this, we need to take some time. Uh, we need to be quicker. 
Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to uh, ask you the, the uh, evidence of uh, use of budesonide in the PPC treatment. What is the firm evidence? Uh, I, I understand there are some, some uh, non-randomized and also some random studies. Uh, I agree with you, the, the evidence, although there are some RCT, I think there is RCT, but uh, it's uh, not so strong. Uh, so we recommend that, but uh, uh, just the recommendation, the, the strength is not that high. Thank you. Because of the uh, very important position of guidance or guideline, uh, even though the recommendation is weak, mm -hmm. but the uh, comment, uh, the comment is there. Mm -hmm. The fact is very important. So uh, I see. I'm not sure whether this uh, recommendation is valid or not. Uh, yes. Again, Professor Ma won't recommend this because Professor Ma formulated this part treatment. <laughs> Uh, there's an uh, uh, observation about uh, budesonide uh, with uh, UDCA uh, to treat uh, PBC. And uh, also Hirschfeld, uh, Professor Hirschfeld, GD, GDO, mm -hmm. uh, have a RCT yes. uh, study, but uh, number of patients maybe so around the 30 uh, each group uh, with or uh, without budesonide uh, treatment. And, uh, um, Budesonide combination treatment can decrease uh, LP levels significantly when compared to UDCA uh, model treatment. And um, so, but the liver histology didn't uh, improve in combination uh, treatment. It's, uh, I think his paper is uh, publishing, uh, but uh, uh, still didn't come out. And uh, in my clinic, uh, uh, in my clinic practice, uh, some patients um, with uh, heavy or severe inflammation in port tract, but uh, they cannot fit the, the criteria of uh, overlap syndromes. I use it to uh, add some buddhismite. Those patients may have a good effect uh, in, in but uh, I don't have uh, evidence. Uh, it's uh, okay. Maybe yeah. we need to uh, carefully re rephrase in the, the text, try to make it uh, uh, not that strong, to be yeah. careful, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, either in the, both in the description and recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.